Inside Bill's Brain, Decoding Bill Gates examines the work that former Microsoft CEO Bill Gates has done in the years since he left his corporate gig that helped make him the richest man in the world at one point. He's brought innovative thinking to such areas as sanitation, disease eradication, and renewable energy. The Netflix series was directed by Oscar-winning director Davis Guggenheim, who joins us today. I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby. And the first question I want to ask is, what is the biggest misconception you had about Bill Gates before you got to know him? I think the biggest misconception is that he's sort of a, a supercomputer who has no emotions, you know. And uh, what, I, what I realized getting to know him is he's, he's a very emotional person. He's the first person to cry at movies. His kids make fun of him for it. But it's just a side that you don't see until you get to know him better. Did, uh, did Gates require any cajoling in order to say yes to participating in this project? Because, I mean, it did, it did come about because uh, you, two, you two had gotten to know each other over a couple of years. Uh, but uh, was he apprehensive at first about doing this? Did he, did he require any, like, sort of needling to say yes? Yeah, I think, he, I think his biggest worry was time. Like he's a busy guy, and even when we were filming with him, there would be we'd have schedules that were like five minutes, you know, shot of you walking through the hallway, ten minutes, you know, uh, eating lunch. He he is hyper scheduled, so he didn't want this thing to keep him from doing the work that he's doing. But once he got sort of the premise of it, uh, I think he was all in, and and. and the, so weird. You know, the Sunshine Sax has, I'm going to turn them off. They asked to, um, they asked to keep them on speaker myself. Sorry. Um, what, were, what was the question again? Sorry. Uh, did he require any like cajoling to participate in the project? Yeah, he was just mostly concerned about his time. Like, were we going to, you know, pull too much in his time? Because he's busy and he's doing, you know, he's trying to eradicate polio. Um, He's trying to get vaccines to people uh, in third world countries. He's trying to solve American education. He's doing and countless, countless other things. And the idea of a documentary or a documentary series is like, that, that's not doing what he, that's not what he's really focused on or wants to do. Once he realized, okay, the way we were doing it was sympathetic to his time, he was all in. And then he just let me do what I want. So one of the, uh, this documentary premiered uh, uh, this past September, and I'm curious, uh, have there been any major, has there been any major progress on any of the initiatives that are shown in the movie since the film was completed? I know that um, uh, the whole thing with uh, nuclear energy has, is, was put on hold because of issues with, uh, issues with uh, the U.S. government and China. Uh, I'm just curious, has there been uh, any uh, movement on any of that stuff? Well, the interesting thing is, I chose to pick the more difficult things he was working on. So, and a lot of people will criticize my movies and they'll criticize a lot, you know, saying, well, this is just, you know, hero worship. And, uh, um, but in this case, it, I could have said, you know, he saved 10 million lives by bringing vaccines to poor countries. I chose not to even talk about that. I chose to pick like the more sort of gnarly, um, tough things he's trying to tackle. Like nuclear power is one of the toughest things anyone should even want to even talk about. You get slammed at a dinner party. Unfortunately, because a, a polio is doing really well and then COVID hit. And so COVID has kept uh, these brave, very brave healthcare workers to go out in the field and do the work they do, uh, especially in war-torn areas, in places where COVID is flaring up. So po polio is taking a step back you know, we're not going to know how far back until after COVID. Um, the, the, this sanitation, which that episode is about redesigning toilets. That was actually when I pitched it to Netflix. I, I, I started with, I'm going to do the best hour you've ever seen on toilets. Um, and actually, that's going really well. The last time I talked to Bill, he said the, the, um, the designs are getting better and better. And the idea of getting a cheap, usable toilet into third world countries is, is now a, a reality. And that sounds really dumb and geeky to say, but actually, if you could pull it off, 
you save millions of lives because um, that means that kids are not playing in water that's full of shit. Uh, and uh, it's not really the best topic for an episode of television, but I wanted to do it. And that's going really well. And the nuclear power keeps swinging back and forth depending on you know, where you are in the political moment. But his work and his designs are going forward. And I actually believe as someone who has have done, have made documentaries about climate change, I think we have to consider nuclear power as a real, as a real option. It's, you know, if you get, if you get it wrong, you know, you can endanger a lot of people. If you get it right, you have a clean source of power. Like you can make, you know, 50 years of clean power that, that, that is not putting CO2 in the sky. So I'm really, I really get really excited when he's working on that. I don't know, that may be, so I, I would say to answer your question, polio's taking a step back, toilets taking a step forward, and probably nuclear power, I'll talk to him about it, is probably where it was last time we talked. But in the meantime, I've talked to him maybe 10 times and he's deep in the COVID thing in terms of accelerating the research for a new vaccine and accelerating the, um, the progress on therapeutics. So even before there's a vaccine, something that can help people not you know, die when they get COVID. So you know, that to me, him, he's just diving deep into that. So, and it's very comforting to me to see someone who is not running away from these complex problems, but actually digging in deeper. And the fact that there's a really smart person who can look across all these complexities and understand it and, and you know, tell you what the right path to go is. I find him, every time I talk to him during COVID, I feel a little bit better because he explains everything so well. And he's putting his money into getting some solutions on these, on these, on these, um, on these fronts. The thing that I thought was interesting about some of the other things that you showed uh, in his approach with philanthropy towards these different things is that a lot of these things required a new way of thinking. And I, I think probably the most uh, obvious example of that is uh, the whole issue of, uh, 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 of sanitation and the idea of basically redesigning and uh, reformatting uh, what a toilet does. Uh, and I'm curious, has anything with COVID uh, in your conversations uh, with, with Gates since then, has any, has any issue related to COVID required that kind of fundamental rethinking of how to approach a problem? Well, I'll answer that a little bit of a different way because I know what you're saying. I mean, what, I mean, the amazing thing is poor sanitation is killing millions of people. But smart people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to think about it, you know? They don't want to think about shit. They don't want to think about their, their own families. As long as their toilet's working, it's fine, you know? And so he, but, he, but Bill Gates is the kind of guy who says, wait a minute, you know, this doesn't work. You know, a, a massive sanitation system is not going to work in a third world country. I'm going to figure out how to fix that. And that's what's so extraordinary about him. In terms of COVID, I think what's you, particularly useful about his brain is he thinks across all sorts of expertise. And you know, when I talk to him, it's like the immunologists are so good, but they only think about this. They think about, but they, you know, they, they, you know, and the guys who think who come up with vaccines are really good at coming up with the vaccine. They don't think about how to manuf manufacture it. And the guys who figure out how to manufacture it don't know how to distribute it, right? And, and I'm missing like 10 other things that take you from looking for a vaccine to getting a vaccine into your home. And Bill is really good at looking across all those things. He can talk to, talk to Fauci, which he does all the time. He can talk to an immunologist. He can talk to the guy who has the one factory in Japan that makes these vaccines. And he can pull it all together and see a path to when you get that vaccine, and by there's a path to get to that vaccine, to getting that vaccine to millions of people. And to me, that's, I think he's, that's, that's one of a kind person. And you find that even in our government, even in these incredible labs where the smartest people in the world are doing it, they can only see that and they can't see you know, the big picture. And Bill's really, really good at being able to understand the language of this really smart scientist and then understanding how it works in the real world. That's his special power. Uh, we saw brief mentions of Gates' uh, first child, Jennifer, 
Uh, but we didn't see anything about his two other children. I didn't know until after I watched the documentary and I looked him up that he had two other children. Uh, I'm curious as to why that was and was there, uh, and if there was a specific reason why they didn't appear in the film. This wasn't my focus, you know, and I, um, um, it wasn't like they were off limits. It was more that the, it just wasn't, there's so many parts of his biography that I didn't use. I used parts of his biography that kind of reveal why he thinks. So there are, you know, one of the toughest things is talking about the antitrust case. From, you know, when the US government tried to break up Microsoft because it was monopoly. That, you know, I went, I went to all the dark places I wanted to go. And I, I, you know, I, I used very tough video of him, you know, um, being interviewed by the US government and interrogated. But I didn't, there wasn't any reason not to talk about his kids, but there wasn't any good reason to talk about his kids. So I didn't, you know. Uh, in uh, looking at your filmography, one thing that I never realized was that you had directed a lot of episodic television before you released, before uh, An Inconvenient Truth came yeah. out. Uh, you directed sh uh, episodes for shows like uh, Deadwood, uh, 24, and The Shield, which I consider the best drama of the 21st century. Um, I I'm curious, was it difficult to go from directing TV episodes to directing uh, documentary feature films? You know, my father made documentary films in Washington, D.C., and he was uh, sort of my hero, and he taught me uh, a lot of what I know about filmmaking. And when I got out of college, I looked at his career, and I was like, I, will, I could never come close to what he's accomplished. He, he, he won four Academy Awards. And so I was like, I'm moving to Hollywood. Forget documentaries, I'm gonna make it in Hollywood and find my own you know, area where I can shine. And that's what I did for more than 10 years. Uh, and sort of had my ups and downs and loved directing episodic television. And then I, it's a long story, but um, I got fired off a big Hollywood movie training day and uh it was, it was at warner brothers it was set up it was going to be my you know my big break and uh suddenly i got i got thrown back into making documentaries because i couldn't get work anywhere else um but as i look back I, th I think i was really lucky that i did episodic television because it's a great and i loved it it was th there's nothing about it which i hate i loved it um but um what I loved is, is taking a lot of the storytelling, uh, the really strong storytellers on shows like The Shield or Deadwood um, or Alias or 24, and how, how, how in that period where I think television was really getting stronger and stronger and the writing was getting better and better, and saying, okay, how do I bring some of that into nonfiction? And the timing was really good because nonfiction was starting to change. Guys like Mike, Michael Moore and Errol Morris were kind of challenging a kind of form that was sort of stuck in place. And so as I entered nonfiction in the late 90s, or basically the early 2000s, the form was opening up and I could, I could do, I could bring, you know, the cameras that I was using, some of the storytelling effects that I was using and do anything I wanted. So it was actually, I was super lucky that I, you know, did this and then I went to that and, and, uh, and in that 20 year period, I think the, the, the lines between fiction and nonfiction scripted and, and nonfiction have blurred in a wonderful way. And so I, I feel pretty lucky to, to, to have done both. So I mentioned that uh, in the introduction that you are, uh, that uh, you are an Oscar winner, you're one fourth of the way to your father. So, you know, we'll just, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll keep that tracker up there. But um, uh, you won the Best Documentary Feature Oscar in, uh, in 2006 for uh, An Inconvenient Truth, uh, which uh, was a landmark documentary when it came out. But I'm curious, what was that, what was that night like? And uh, the other ulterior motive for asking this question is, uh, I've always wanted to ask, how hard of a partier is the former vice president? <laughs> I would say that was a magical night. Um, it was a confluence of two incredible things. One was we had done something impossible with this movie. It was a slideshow um, and it captured the imagination of people. And uh, we did it, we made it in five and a half months and people loved it and it played really, really well. 
And as a filmmaker, you just live for moments like that. But on top of that, and much more importantly, it was about something that was really important. And, uh, you know, um, Al had been trying to convince the world that climate change was urgent and real. And the film helped in, in, in a way in that moment. And uh, that was, so when we won, it was like, holy shit, <laughs> um, our little film uh, is, is, uh, is not only being recognized for an award, but it was actually, you know, the world was, was learning about climate change. And so, so it, you know, that, that kind of feeling will, will never happen again. It was really special. And, and you know, Al was partners in it. We were, uh, we were helping him, he was helping us, and it was just a magical night. How, how hard a partier was he for that night, though, is what I'm curious about. Nah, I mean, we, we were, maybe we all had one extra drink. Um, I remember, I think we were, up, we were up at the Vanity Fair party till like three or four in the morning, but it was just, it was pure fun and, and not a hard partier. Well, uh, Davis, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you all the best this Emmy season. And to all of our viewers, please like this video, subscribe to our channel to get all our latest content, and don't forget to go to goldderby.com and use the Gold Derby app to make your predictions and see if you can outsmart the top prognosticators in Hollywood. Thanks so much, Davis. Thanks, Charlie.